Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Scale for ETEL Thursday, not just morning, sometimes afternoon webinar slot. Uh, it's really great to have you all here. Um, and as we usually do, I'm going to ask everyone to just say hello and tell us what you're wearing underneath your top. Like, are you in pajama bottoms today? Are you wearing jeans? Are you wearing shorts? Just a quick hello. No, I don't want anyone to be too embarrassed. No photos embarrassed. needed. <laughs> <laughs> and don't say your birthday suit, because obviously we need to see. Um, we might we might ask you to come on stage. Yes, we've just started, Richard. Welcome. We started exactly 10 seconds ago or so. Uh, so anybody else out there would like to say hello and reveal what they're what they're wearing. So me, I'm I'm wearing um, I'm wearing leggings. How about you, Rail? What are you really wearing underneath that? <laughs> Nothing, Nothing too exciting. Just some tracksuit pants, really track sweatpants. Suit pants. <laughs> I do have really Larry socks though. So I'm going to see if I can show you guys my socks. There you go. Oh, look at that. Oh, no, not really oh, fancy. Hang on, I've got to really show these socks. Look at them. Look at these socks. Aren't they cool? <laughs> avocado. <laughs> avocado. Oh, <wow>. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, hello. Hello. Nobody is revealing what they're wearing, by the way. Nobody <laughs> has the gun. There we go. Oh, yeah, yeah well, I got it's healing up here, but I got the <laughs> motorbike crash on my knee there. It's almost oh, done. No. Mm. All that of a sudden, terrible. Up. I finally got back into the gym, so it's feeling good now. Wow. Yeah, that must have been wow. painful, super painful. Uh, you really ought to wear knee pads next time. Yeah, I've got to ask. Oh, I thought you were really knee pads. Good. Right? Yeah, lesson <laughs> learned. Well, you're, are you in Bali? Is it Bali? Exactly, in Bali. And, you know, the, uh, the traffic out here is a little bit more chaotic than most places, so... Um, yeah. It took too long to have my first crash, so finally got it out of the way. It's good. Nice. Cool. Good. Well, oh, it looks like we've got a full house today, so it's really lovely to see people in shorts, sweatpants, flip flops, all sorts of things. And then anyone, anyone dressed up though? Anyone wearing something slightly, uh, yeah. you know, slightly smarter? Anyone in stilettos? Come on, boys. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to admit to it. <laughs> yeah, get dressed up for the webinar tonight. Here we go. Put on the good pants. Cool. All right. So let's do quick introductions for everyone. So as you can see, there's a crowd on stage. And if anybody else would really love to join, uh, you're very welcome to do so. Uh, when you want to ask your questions, we'll be happy to bring you up on stage. But today, over to the right of me, we have Rael. I'm going to kind of point at him. Hello. Oh, yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> and then below that, we have Chenille. Are you going to wave? Oh, cool. Hello. And Rael and Chenille represent Nozzle, and they're going to be talking about customer lifetime value, which is one of those subjects that I find difficult to deal with on Amazon. So I personally... Yeah sell consumables and i do know that i have a pretty good repeat purchase rate uh with some of my products but actually trying to get to those statistics really tough and it's one of those exercises that i have to organize to do with my va every so often and then we also have danny from bali so good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he's going to be talking about a ppc hack that Everybody just about doesn't know, I would hope. Anyway, we'll see. Uh, we can take votes later. And of course, there's Christian and myself. And if you guys have participated in these webinars before, you'll know that there's a questions tab uh, over to the right of the chat box on your screen. And it would be probably really helpful if we put all the questions in there. I mean, you can chat away during the presentations if you like but if you put your questions into the question area then we can copy paste that um, into our email follow-up and just make sure that you can all see yeah. uh, the answers to every single question as well cool all right so without further ado um, and it's really lovely to know that we're sort of not in lockdown here in the UK anymore <laughs> but I'm going to hand over to Rail. 
Brilliant. Thank you. And thanks for, thanks for having me, everybody. Um, very much looking forward to uh, presenting this. It's a topic that's extremely close to my heart. Um, and uh, to your point, Shelley, it's not, not very well understood, um, but it's such a powerful tool um, if you're, you know, know how to use it, understand how to calculate it um, and, and, and put in the effort to do that. So uh, hopefully everybody should be able to see uh, my slides now. Um, and then uh, happy to um, just crack on with it. Cool. So customer lifetime value, what I'm going to be talking about, uh, really four things. The actual sort of slides presentation are, are quite quite short. I'm hoping uh, that, you know, there'll be plenty of questions about this. And, and I think a lot of people get probably the most out of the, the Q&A section uh, once I've just sort of got got you know, these questions uh, out of the way for context. So the first one is just simply, what is it, customer lifetime value? Uh, the, then we go in, why should you actually care about it? Uh, how do I calculate it uh, with an Amazon context, of course? And then how do you increase it? So pretty four basic questions, but can be a little bit tricky, um, you know, answering them. So the very first thing is, what is customer lifetime value, CLV? And um, really the, the definition uh, is, is the total net profit from any given customer over the entire period that you have a relationship with uh, that given customer. And so if you look at the entire user journey uh, of, of one of the customers on, on Amazon, uh, this is just one, you know, I've just laid out a basic scenario here of what, of what is quite typical. Uh, so you have the first interaction, which is the user comes in via, let's say a, a PPC ad, uh, and they make their first purchase. Um, and I guess most of, um, you know, Amazon's tools and metrics um, and the way we've almost been conditioned is to kind of just stop thinking about after what happens at stage one, right? Uh, but actually, if you could figure out a way to find out what happens after that. So do they come back for another purchase? So there's, in this case, yeah, there's a second purchase. And of course, uh, one of the great uh, scenarios would be if they subscribe and save, uh, and then they stage three, they purchase again, stage four, they purchase again. And for whatever reason, reason stage five, what's called churn, they sort of sever the relationship with you and, and whatever it is that, you know, they, they don't buy from you again. But taking the, the big picture over the entire journey uh, from start to finish, from their first purchase to the last purchase, uh, understanding that data set uh, can be extremely, extremely powerful. And so uh, customer lifetime values is the net profit from any given customer throughout that entire journey. And just going towards the bottom there, where uh, if customer lifetime value, just that, that the bottom left on the green box, if the lifetime value is greater than what's called your customer acquisition cost, um, and so that's typically... Uh, you know, all the money you spend on acquiring that customer in a very simplistic sense, it could be the ad just the advertising uh, cost. But of course, you know, you can go into a whole lot of detail of other costs that are uh, uh, spent acquiring a customer, but we'll keep it sort of quite uh, simplistic now. So uh, if your customer lifetime value is greater than your customer acquisition cost, then you're in a good place. You're ultimately overall profitable. Uh, but if that lifetime value, the total profit you get from that individual is less than what you spent trying to acquire uh, that individual, uh, then, of course, you're not in a good place and you're not profitable and you're going to be in a, you know, pr pretty severe uh, circumstances later on. Uh, so that's kind of the conceptual framework for what is customer lifetime uh, value. So why should you care? Right. And so two, two primary reasons uh, for me, and I guess most people have heard something along these lines. Uh, in that it's easier to sell to an existing customer than to a new one. And so existing customers are 50% more likely to try new products. Uh, and actually, not only that, they spend uh, on average 31% more when compared to new customers. Um, and so the probability of selling to an existing customer roughly 60 to 70%, whilst the new customer 2 to 20%. And so you know, if you think about where you want to focus your efforts, uh, in terms of new customers versus existing customers, it's clearly a lot easier to focus on the existing customers. Um, on the right, there is another major reason, which is, you know, what is the effect of acquiring a new customer versus upselling to an existing customer uh, on your bottom line, meaning overall profitability? And it turns out that the retention is twice as impactful uh, on overall profitability than acquisition, as than acquiring a new customer. And so they're very, very good reasons why you should focus on repeat purchases uh, and focusing on your existing customer base to grow overall uh, revenue and profitability over time. 
Now, I mean, a couple of caveats with that. Um, you know, I, each product or business is quite different. I mean, what is the ideal balance between uh, time and effort and money spent on acquiring new customers versus uh, selling to existing ones? Uh, you know, that's going to that's going to differ on, on personal circumstances. You need some sort of critical mass of an existing base that you can you know expect them to go and, and do repeat purchases. Um, and the second thing is not all products, of course, lend themselves to repeat purchases. Right. I mean, you know, we've got customers that are selling very high priced furniture items. Um, and so, you know, the lifetime value is probably less. Uh, meaningful to them because it's it's you know it's, it's such an infrequent per purchase for such a uh, large amount, um, and because it's infrequent, by the time you get to the second purchase, you could be you know a few years down the line uh, before they do that. But if there are many many products that do uh, fit are a very extremely good fit for for lifetime value, and this is you know frequent uh, frequent purchases, a lot of a lot of items in consumer packaged goods, for instance, where you need to replenish things, um, supplements, you know, all that kind of stuff are, are really, really good candidates to, to focus on this particular metric. Um, how do I calculate it is, is the third one. So, I mean, if you, if you kind of Google this, you can go down a real rabbit hole on, on how to calculate <laughs> customer lifetime value. You can get formulas that are sort of two pages long and all that. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is, is, is kind of a, a more simplified version specifically for, for an Amazon context. Um, and so you'll start off with your uh, gross revenue. Uh, you'll want to subtract out, of course, anything like, um, you know, promotions and coupons and things like that. Uh, you'll then subtract out any sales tax. Uh, any Amazon related fees, so fulfillment and storage and referral fees and things like that. So FBA, seller for full prime, FBM, all that. Uh, and then you want to subtract out your cost of goods sold, your COGS. Um, so that's manufacturing costs and, you know, cost to get it to, to a warehouse and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then finally, you'd subtract out your advertising spend, your ad spend. Now, I've broken, broken out the ad spend actually as a separate separate box and there's there's kind of a good reason for that so if you take firstly that middle box of sales tax amazon fees and, and cogs um, they essentially scale line linearly with each purchase meaning every unit uh that somebody buys so it's their second purchase that middle block is roughly this going to be the same number per unit sold right you don't have much control over these things either. So sales tax is what it is. Amazon fees, right? Amazon pretty much dictates what, what they are. You have very little uh, leverage there to change that. And your cost of goods sold, whilst you can you know, negotiate better deals with suppliers and things like that, uh, still quite, quite a difficult thing to do and, and it takes a long time, et cetera. But on the advertising side, on the right block there, typically, um, it's a once-off cost to acquire uh, a customer, right? So you would spend some some money on ad spend on, on ad budgets on PPC or whatever it is, and then someone uh, buys your product from that. Um, typically, you're not going to be advertising to that person again. Most of the the research on this will say, in an Amazon context, if somebody wants to reorder, they will most likely go into you know their previous orders and, and hit the reorder button rather than say clicking on another ad of yours um, and, then, and then ordering from that ad again. So you know the advertising side is really something that you can control, um, and, and and is a big focus of uh, how to use customer lifetime value to its full potential. So this brings us, I guess, to the the, the question of ACOS. Um, so I'm tying this now, uh, how to use the lifetime value uh, in, in, in a PPC context. And so if you think about ACOS, it's really just measuring um, profitability of the first sale, right? Um, and so you've got your ad spend divided by your ad sale and you you know, base a lot of your decisions off what that number actually is. You have a break even ACOS, which is, again, only based off that first sale. Um, but the big question is, what if uh, that ad spend actually contributed towards future profits too, right? And so if you look beyond that first sale, if someone's buying from you more than once, then it becomes a very different calculation and your actions uh, are very different off the back of that. So let's take a, a very basic example here. So on the left-hand side, a typical example of, you know, you spend uh, $10, uh, the ad sale is $20 and you've got an ACOS of 50%, which, you know, depending if it's a product launch or a mature product and where you are on your journey, 50%, if it's mature, is, you know, you obviously want to get it, get it quite a lot lower than that. Um, so that doesn't look too good on the optics. But actually, 
if you took that whole journey uh, of that customer over the entire lifetime that 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 they have with you, um, let's you know hypothetically, let's say they make three more purchases of that same item of twenty dollars, and so you've got four. Uh, instances of $20 with that person, which equals 80. And now your ACOS actually looks very, very different, right? It's the same $10 ad spend, but spread out across four separate purchases of 20. And so your ACOS now is 12.5% instead of that initial 50%. And so this is, you know, very, very different to, I guess, how we've been conditioned to think on Amazon and overly focusing on uh, a specific ACOS number, where actually you should be thinking about uh, everything that happens with that customer and repeat purchases to get to your your true ACOS, as as we call it. Um, and so, how do we use this? How do you use this this information of of a true ACOS? And so, we think this is uh, you know a game changer. It's a competitive advantage and fundamentally alters uh, where you should focus your PPC budgets and what products to focus them on as well. Uh, so, two examples there. So, uh, number one is. Uh, for instance, if you're selling multiple multiple products and your supplements have a higher customer lifetime value than face cream, uh, then you should focus more of your budgets on supplements, right? That's ultimately going to be much more profitable uh, for you in the long run uh, than face cream. Um, the second one is slightly more more subtle, and we've seen this with a number of, of, of customers that we work with, where, uh, for instance, if you know that a low-value item uh, is the first purchase, a gateway sort of purchase, uh, in the future leads to the purchase of a higher value item down the line, um, you can just simply outbid your competitors. So we had this example of a customer probably about, I think it was about four to six months ago, somewhere around there, um, where the initial purchase was um, was dog, so they sell multiple dog products. Um, so the initial purchase was poop bags of all things, and which is probably, I think, you know, eight or nine uh, dollars. Um, but actually, it turns out that 25% of them further down the line within, I think it was four months, actually land up buying a dog bed, which is 50 or $60. And so if you have that information, um, you obviously uh, can spend a lot more in acquiring uh, those sorts of, of, of customers to buy the poop bags first. And you're prepared to spend you know, a higher CPC because you know what happens further down the line. And so you can outbid your competitors there. Uh, you can gain market share whilst still being profitable. And so those are, I guess, two, two cases where, you know, understanding what happens throughout the entire lifetime um, and how that translates back into your PPC strategy are, are, are really, really useful. And it can really help you, um, you know, gain market share you, uh, and, and outbid your competitors as, as a result, but always with the caveat of being, um, you know, this is still uh, ultimately profitable for you. So I hope that that, you know, gives a quite a um, good sense of why you should care how to use it um, and how to tie it to PPC. So the final thing here is just how do you how do you increase it? What are the ways in which you can actually increase, uh, you know, customer lifetime value? And so there are four, four ideas here. Clearly, the nature of your product is probably the most important thing. Is it something that people need uh, to fill up or top up on a frequent basis? Even if it's a small amount, it doesn't matter. Um, so getting somebody on a subscribe and save clearly uh, is, 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 is a great situation to have. Um, another way to increase the uh, customer lifetime value is to increase the average order value. And so that's three for two offers, uh, things like that. Bundling. Uh, is 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 really good as well, and especially with with virtual bundling. Uh, I'm not sure if it's available in the UK yet, but certainly in the US um, is, uh, is 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 hugely helpful as well. Um, the same sort of data sets where you're analyzing repeat purchases. You know, it doesn't have to be that they're buying the same ASIN all the time. It could be that you know purchases two and three they could go for a, a, a higher capacity, right? Instead of a, a single item, it's a multi pack, or you know, going from um, different sizes or whatever it may be. So bundling items together is, is definitely one way to increase uh, your customer lifetime value. Um, and then number four is adding complementary products. And so you know, depending if you're looking to launch, uh, expand your portfolio, launch new products. You can add complementary products to the ones that you're already selling. Um, again, Amazon can give you quite a good head start on this when you're looking at brand analytics data. You can see what items, uh, what ASINs uh, customers are comparing 
um, your um, your ASINs to. Some of them might be competitors, but actually some of the time it could be complementary products as well. And so these are just some ideas for um, launching complementary products and therefore you can increase your, your customer lifetime value that way as well. Um, so that's you know pretty much the, the quick uh, presentation on uh, answering those those fundamental questions there. Um, I guess there's there's um, I can do sort of two things here. The, the first one is you know how do you actually get this information to do this right? And so um, it is possible in a in a very sort of manual way uh, if you are a FBA if you're using FBA that you can go into uh, download the data. Um, only comes in monthly uh, increments, unfortunately. Uh, and I'm happy to you know, send a follow-up email or um, put it in the chat on how you can actually, you know, the steps to actually do this with Amazon reporting. Um, you basically go into the reports fulfilled by Amazon and then Amazon fulfilled shipments, and that will give you the data, but you've got to build pivot tables. Um, you, you do need a, a good chunk of data to understand this. It's not really useful to, you know, download two to three months worth of, of data. It's not really going to tell you much um, and, and understand the patterns. I mean, I would recommend ideally uh, a year's worth of data to really understand and get a, a representative sample of what's of what's going on. Um, so again, I, I can post that in the in the chat on how to do that. Um, the other way to do it is, uh, and I, I guess of course I'd say this, but there are tools to help you and automate that that process. So you don't have to, you know, download all this data, create your pivot tables, and land up with with huge sort of spreadsheets uh, and formulas all over the place. Um, so I think uh, if I just switch tabs quickly, um, are people you're able to see the um, you're able to see now the, yeah, the demo? okay excellent good stuff cool uh, so this is I mean I just wanted to show uh, a very you know simple tool of of something that Nozzle provides to help you with with lifetime value. Um, and so we offer what we call a retail analytics uh, product and the lifetime value. We do a whole bunch of things, but of course, I'm just going to focus on the on the uh, the lifetime value component here. Um, and so, you know, th the first thing uh, we do is just analyze your repeat purchases, right? And so the bottom left here is saying um, what percentage of your total sales are attributable to repeat purchase sales, right? And so, uh, and is that growing over time? So in this, you know, this is a demo. So, you know, it's obviously pretty good um, to say, you know, that's almost doubling uh, year on year, for instance. Uh, the bottom right is saying out of your entire customer base on Amazon, how many of what percentage are repeat purchase customers and, and is that growing uh, over time as well? So, you know, it's just, again, to calibrate, you know, what's a good number? What percentage of your total sales should be um, uh, uh, repeat purchase sales? It's pretty hard to give you a, a general answer to that. It really depends on the nature of, of your product and circumstance, how long you've been selling the product for, et cetera. I'm happy to take, I guess, individual questions on that, but uh, pretty hard to generalize that. Um, and then if we go to uh, the lifetime value overview, uh, this is actually just saying what your uh, overall customer lifetime value actually is. Um, over here, we're saying this is quite interesting for for a bunch of our uh, of, of customers. Where um, if so, this is saying if somebody, uh, for instance, first buys something in category three, whatever it may be, let's call it you know dog beds, um, do they result in in a higher life, lifetime value than somebody who first purchases uh, category one, which might be the poop bags, for instance? And so that that kind of gives you a sense of what that gateway product might be. Um, you could change your PPC budget allocation if you know that people in category three ultimately land up with, you know, a higher lifetime value than people in category one, for instance. Um, the bottom one here is just saying, trying to give you a sense of, you know, how reliant are you on your core set of, of customers? So, you know, there's this idea of a sort of 80-20 rule. So 20% of your customers are responsible for 80% of your, your sales or profits, et cetera. Uh, again, this is just a sort of demo, but in this case, 20% of the customers are uh, nearly half of all, of, of all your sales. Um, and that just gives you, you know, is it worth, given that they're half of all my sales, is it worth uh, trying to sort of upsell them, get them to increase their repeat purchase rate to that specific customer base? Or, you know, do I need to spend more time diversifying because I'm a little bit worried that, you know, it's Amazon and, you know, they don't like me having a direct relationship with that, with that customer, et cetera, right? So is it too risky, actually, if I'm over-reliant um, on those yep, customers? The other side of that rail is if, if you yeah. have a very high proportion of sales from a small number of customers, then give them more love, you know, as much as you can. Yeah, look totally. after them. Totally. Get, try and engage with them as much as you can because yeah. those people are clearly driving a bottom line. They're going to yeah. be 
recommending you to their friends and everyone else you know they'll become your advocates and your ambassadors totally. for your brand as well as uh, as well as your customers but just use that kind of data and that kind of insight to know okay these people are worth doing something extra for and you know send them a christmas card you know, it's just, just do some something extra to make them notice that you care about yeah. them as more than just a number on their bottom line but you try and do something more with them yeah uh couldn't agree more and that obviously increases the lifetime value anyway so um that sort of stuff um the last thing i wanted to show is just you know this goes into quite a lot more uh depth on the individual purchase behavior path right and so for instance uh, I mean, I'm not going to go into sort of individual details on the numbers here, but the, the, the basic idea here is to analyze the individual purchases. So what that means is when somebody makes their second, third, fourth purchase from you, are they just buying uh, the same ASIN over and over again? Or are they buying a variation, a uh, different size, a different capacity, whatever it may be? Or actually, are they hopping across categories? And so, you know, to, to carry on with the dog example, are they going you know, from poop care products into toys and, and then into bones and, you know, all that sort of thing. So it's actually quite good guidance on, um, it's, you know, it's one thing, it's, it's obviously great to have repeat purchase uh, customers, but, you know, what are they actually buying? Is it just the same ASIN over and over again? So, you know, the idea here is, um, you know, to really understand what ASINs you should be focusing on. I mean, if if it's the case that people are not, uh, buying when, when they repeat purchase and they're not doing, uh, they're not buying variations, they're not going across categories, all that sort of stuff. They're literally just buying the same thing over and over again. I mean, in many ways, that could be a pretty good thing, right? That means you know where to focus your energy in terms of your portfolio. Um, you might want to ramp that up, et cetera, and just, you know, focus focus your, your business on, on that sort of core ASIN or core ASINs. Uh, but if, for instance, they are hopping across categories, then, of course, uh, there are ideas there on, uh, you know, three for two offers or bundling uh, ideas, et cetera, things like that. Uh, yeah, so I guess that's just, um, you know, what I, I wanted to show there on on the some of the tools that, that enable you to do this analysis. Uh, but, of course, there is uh, always the option of, um, of, of using, you know, Amazon's own reports with uh, spreadsheets, et cetera, to um to get some of this information out so uh yeah that's it in terms of um you know what i wanted to uh to share there okay thanks Rail. um we've got a couple of questions but they're not too many and um she's yeah. already well, answered some of them so let's if we continue with danny's segment uh, we can then sure. come back and do to all the questions uh together afterwards and if any of the audience has other questions for this segment just uh, ask them in the questions tab and we'll we'll cover everything um, at the end of the presentation. Okay, sounds good. Mine is short and action packed for you guys. So it is bound to dig up a bunch of questions. So I'll get this one going. Get the screen share tunnel of death going on here. Okay. Slideshow. Okay, so this one is the secret fourth Amazon ads match type that no one uses. So a lot of people have no idea that there is this fourth match type. And it's very useful in very specific situations. So it's really good for discovering profitable keywords, basically like auto campaigns, without wasting ad spend on irrelevant keywords. So in this presentation, it's going to be short but sweet. First off, what the heck is broad match modified match type? That's what we're going to be talking about here. What are the best uses for broad match modified, which I'm going to be referring to as BMM or brevity, and how to access this secret match type? It's not in the interface. So if you don't know about this, what I'm about to show you, then you're not going to be able to actually even know it exists. And if you stay until the end, I'm going to give you guys my copy and paste instant broad match modified Excel formula. So if you're like me, I like to use Excel, um, the bulk files to do lots of bulk updates to my campaigns all at once. And this just, you copy and paste it into the cell and you can instantly turn keywords into broad match modified. It is a little bit technical. Um, just so you guys know that I know what I'm talking about. Here's a little bit about me. I got two podcasts, uh, the Actualized Freedom podcast, worked with uh, some brands like Impact Theory, Odd Bods, and uh, I'm sure you guys have heard of like AMPM Podcast, Helium 10, uh, you know, all, the, all those guys, Six Leaf. And that's me on my motorcycle, which uh, I guys, for those of you who showed up at the start, you guys saw my knee, and uh, that's the motorcycle that it crashed off of. So it's got a few scrapes on it. 
And just for social proof, you guys know that I know what I'm talking about. There's uh, one of our accounts, 600 grand in sales, another one, 2 million in sales, uh, you know, 650 in sales, yada, yada, yada. You guys know that I know what I'm talking about. Okay, so the problem here that Broad Match Modified solves is that Broad Match by itself often goes way too broad, similar to an automatic campaign. It often will get irrelevant search terms that Amazon thinks is related. And this is especially a problem if you have a product that um, it's just got a lot of similar products that could be related to those search terms. So some products in general are just like all the main keywords are kind of ambiguous. So I actually have that problem with my agency, Kenji ROI. Like one of our main search terms we bid on for Google ads is Amazon product photography. So you would think that that's people looking for product photography for the Amazon, but we actually get lots of people clicking on search terms related to their, they're wanting to buy a product photography products on Amazon. So completely different customers. And that's a really good example of when a broad match modified a match type would be really useful. And also phrase match is restrictive and doesn't offer as much control over broad match modified. So I did my best to really simplify this for you guys here. Um, it, it is a little bit technical, but we're gonna go into it so you guys can understand this as clearly as I can possibly do it. So basically it goes broad like an automatic campaign, but with hyper control over exactly which sections are, are broad and which sections are not broad. So it's similar to phrase match, but it does not restrict the phrase order. So let's just really spell this out. So it makes sense, right? This is the end of the presentation and you guys can just go do it. Just kidding, just kidding. I wouldn't do that to you guys. So this, hopefully we'll clear this up over here. So we have the same thing on the left and the right. So phrase match and broad match modified, both the algorithm will add words before and after or both before and after. So if it's, um, you know, the uh, word you're going after is, is bucket, then it will add words before bucket and after bucket. Both of them also much, uh, the search term that comes up in the search results must include the target keyword. That's true across both of them. Here's where it gets different. So in phrase match, the target keyword phrase order is unchanged in the search term. So if you put in blue bucket, then it will not show it up for bucket blue or, or anything like that. Broad match modified, that's not the case. The phrase order, can be in any order as long as those keywords are in there. And the other difference is phrase match does not have control over which individual keywords must be included. It is only the actual phrase that you are targeting for the phrase. Broad match modified, you can control individual keywords within your phrase that will show up here. So I'm gonna show you guys a few examples. So here is phrase match, right? On the right there is the targeting door bags. It's the same for all four of these. And on the left we have uh, Polaris Razor 900 door bags. And you can see it's, it just puts a bunch of words before door bags, but it does not change the word door bags and door bags is in every single one of those. So here is the same thing, but with broad match modified. So you can see on the right, there's a little plus symbol in front of each one of these. That means that each one of those keywords has to be in the customer search term somewhere, but the order doesn't necessarily matter. So you can see there, razor door bags. It shows up for the exact phrase, razor door bags. And the next one down, door bag razor. So all of those words are in there, but they're mixed up in a different order. Um, and then the one at the very bottom there is, you know, razor door bags, but it has razor and then it has a thousand XP in between door bags. So it's gonna insert words basically anywhere it can. So I'm gonna go into a few scenarios where this is really useful in a second, but I just wanna show you guys how to actually use this first. So all you do is you add a plus symbol in front of whatever words that you want to be in every search term. And you can do this at, in bulk at this link that I have here below. So I'm gonna show that on the next slide there. It's a totally free tool that's very useful. And all you do is you paste that, that search term with the pluses in front of whatever keywords you want to be in every search term into the broad match match type. So you just choose broad match when you're entering the keywords and just paste it in there with the plus symbols. So this is that tool that I was telling you about there that's found.co.uk slash PPC keyword tool. So all you do is you paste in the words individually into these different columns and then you go down to um, that modified broad match check mark and press concatenate. And then it's gonna output a plus symbol in front of each one of those. You can go just fill these down like as many keywords as you want in there. And it's gonna come up with a whole bunch of variants of that too. So it's really useful for coming up with, you know, every possible variant 
of that keyword every possible order of mixing those up um, as well as just adding the modified broad match plus symbols in front of everything there. So again, guys, it's uh, found.co.uk slash PPC keyword tool, not affiliated with them in any way, and it's totally free. That's a very useful tool. So here are two simple and highly effective broad match modified strategies. Um, and these are, are very simple to enact, and probably everyone is going to is going to be able to implement this in like 15 minutes very easily. So a branded broad match modified campaign. So you guys have probably heard that running a branded campaign for your actual brand keywords is a really good idea. And if you're not doing it, then you should definitely be doing it. Uh, some people are just of the mindset that, oh, why would I pay for my brand name? Like people are already searching for my brand name. Why am I paying for them? They're already coming to my product. Uh, that's a, a really big mistake. Um, those keywords generally perform very, very well and you're just gonna get much more easy sales there. And if you're not bidding on it, then it opens up your competitors to bid on it. Um, people might not be able to find your product as well as they might, you're just, you're just missing out on sales. So definitely bid on your own brand names. So by using broad match modifiers for your brand names, you can essentially tell Amazon to come up with every possible variant of your brand name possible. So um, you, you gotta be a little bit tricky. Like if you have a really generic brand name, then you're going to have to make sure that it is not going to go crazy with it, right? But especially if you have a brand name that's not an actual regular word, like uh, Zaboogaloo or something like that. Let's just say that's your brand name. I hope it's not because it's a terrible brand name. But um, theoretically, you would just get the word Zaboogaloo by itself and a plus symbol in front of that. And then Amazon, in that one single campaign, you have now effectively bid on every single possible search term that includes the word Zaboogaloo. Um, really, really powerful there. Also hyper-targeted auto campaign mode. So this is really, really useful when you have products that it has to be a very specific product. So the examples that I have down here are, you know, uh, 2005 Ranger, uh, Ford Ranger, that's like a type of truck, right? So if you're selling accessories or specific parts specifically for a 2005 Ford Ranger, then usually the auto campaigns and broad match campaigns are going to be bidding on like, you know, Jeep keywords and, and all these unrelated models. And like, no one's ever going to buy, um, you know, no one who's searching for Jeep products is ever going to buy something for a Ford Ranger. This doesn't make sense. So you have to have 2005 and you have to have Ranger within all of the search terms. So this gives you the ability to take advantage of the auto campaign and the broad match campaign, just going exploring and finding all the best keywords without, coming up with all the random ones that don't make any sense. And the other one there, like Razor, RZR, that is like a specific model of a, of a UTV, like a utility terrain vehicle. And it's very unlikely that that word Razor, RZR, is going to be showing up in, in any other context, really. I mean, you're going to have to like test and see what your specific niche is, but try to think of those, those words. Those words, usually it's got to be one or two word phrases that would just really qualify like if they use those phrases in the search at all, then they're pretty much 100% gonna be searching for your product. So that's just a really powerful way to do that. So that's it guys, really short but sweet. Um, the bulk BMM Excel formula is just there, bit.ly slash BMMAMZ. And then uh, I'll send you guys my spreadsheet there with uh, you know instructions on how to use it if you guys want to put all the plus symbols just automatically in front of all your stuff. And that is my blue face there because I just thought that'd be really funny and sent it off to the graphic designer. And uh, yeah, I've been using that as all my profile pictures all across the internet. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, anyone that has any questions about that segment as well, uh, post them in the uh, questions area and we'll go through all of the questions uh, now. Okay, I'll start at the beginning. Um, uh, Teddy Smith asks, uh, in what way is revenue, less tax fees, COGS, et cetera, less ad spend equals CLV different to just calculating the profit margin? Um, I don't know if you want to comment on that as well, Ray. I mean, Chanel answered in the in the chat, but if anyone had not looked at that, uh, Chanel's answer there was that CLV is the net profit attributed to the entire future relationship with the customer. So it's profitability from the customer um, and just checking that. that yeah, way. I mean, absolutely. I mean, as Chanel's... Uh, I don't have too much to add to that. I mean, measuring prof profitability on an individual customer level, 
um, is very different to just sort of overall profitability for your business because not all customers are the same, right? You might be spending money uh, on unprofitable co uh, customers on unprofitable products, et cetera, but really segmenting your customers into what makes them profitable. Is it these ASINs or is it those ASINs? Or sometimes, I mean, there've been so many surprises we've had around, as I said, poop bags leading to dog bed sales and you know all that kind of stuff. So actually measuring on a per, on an individual level, per customer level, uh, it really allows you to focus on your business and understand what ASINs are driving profitability um, as opposed to just looking at your profit and loss statement or something like that. Yeah. And I think that to me, that's the key thing is it's, it's, a, it's a matter of scope. I mean, normally profitability, we look at individual products all the time and, you know, how profitable is this product, um, possibly with its advertising cost as well. But CLV is really about understanding the customer as an individual and then looking across perhaps multiple different products if they buy different products yeah. uh, or repeat purchases. So, just, so in our, the answer to the question really is it's a matter of different, different perspectives, different angle of looking at things. And that can give you some really actionable, useful insights um, to your business. Um, question from Tony Vincent uh, asking if he sells he sell supplements, so should he use a higher ACOS? Um, should you um, answer that already? Yeah, I mean, yeah, again, it's, it's, uh, there's a probably, um, yeah, I mean, there's a very high chance that you, sh you would be able to afford uh, a higher ACOS. Um, but it all depends on you know what, what the repeat purchase behavior is. I mean, supplements naturally lend themselves to repeat purchase behavior. But if you know if ninety nine percent of your customer base, customer base are just buying once and you never hear from them again, then then you know that's that's obviously not a good sign. And and um, yeah, so, so, so uh, is, supplements are, are are a classic product for repeat purchase behavior. So there's a very good chance you could afford a higher ACOS. Exactly. And, and, you know, to me, I just add to that, that it's really just a matter of analyzing your actual figures, your actual data, because different people yeah. will be different. And if you're if you if you analyze the data and you find that your numbers are low for something which should be a high repeat purchase product, then you know, make sure you have subscribe and save activate so that it's easy for people to make repeat purchases. Uh, see if you can bundle, see if uh, you know, is there a problem with the quality of people buying it, using it once and deciding it doesn't it doesn't taste right or doesn't it's not easy to swallow or whatever else yeah, yeah so try and engage yeah. with the customers a bit and understand why they're not repeat purchasing yeah. when brand, brand loyalty is a key thing in that i mean supplements naturally are is super competitive um and so you know if you're building up a, a good brand and they like your your story etc cetera, etc cetera, then they'll they'll purchase from you again but yeah clearly if you're yeah 90 percent of them are just buying once and, and never again you've got a problem so <laughs> yeah. um I think Tony followed it up, um, suggesting mm. that he might try three for two. I mean, again, just say with that that you know, understand your margins and understand what what does three for two mean to you. Do, how does that really impact your your? Yeah, margins? I mean, I, for, for me, before making happen? before making those sorts of decisions, I would still just go through the data to understand. It might not be worth. Again, in, in extreme circumstances, if the majority are, are making just one purchase uh, and then never coming back, then four for three is not going to solve that problem right and so the starting point i would argue is always the same is to just understand that journey a lot better then you can think about how to uh, build more loyalty or increase uh, increase average order value or whatever it is but without the sort of diagnostics to understand what's happening first um i wouldn't sort of jump into a solution absolutely and, and just again to add to that the other thing you can do is although even if most of your sales are normally through amazon you can also explore outside of amazon just to get a, some relationship with a few customers that you could then yeah. have a relationship with and, and have an outside contact with that you can discuss. So, you know, set up a landing page, set up a, 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 a page that people can go to to buy, run some ads through it, get some customers through there. And then you can actually have a conversation with those people and understand in detail what it is they they like or don't like about the product, why, why they would or wouldn't buy it again. Yeah. Um, yeah. And in a way that you can't do with Amazon customers because, of, because Amazon restricts. Agreed. And there's something else to add there, which um, I should have mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, it's often not a good, I know, you, you know, clearly you want to quicken the feedback loop, right? So someone buys from you, do they buy from you again so you can learn, et cetera. Um, and one of the easiest ways to do that, obviously, is to offer a discount or coupon or whatever it may be. But often that's quite a, <laughs> it's a misleading, uh, you know, signal ultimately because, um yeah, I mean, are they just buying because it's because it's I don't know two pounds or I don't know whatever it is, right? And so and so like you need to understand, and that's not reflective of true profitability. Now, it's not to say, of course, um, discounts and coupons and all that absolutely have their place, 
but it's often uh, biases the data set if you're trying to work it out, if you're just throwing it out there to get people to use it. Um, and, and then, you know, they're just buying it for the wrong reasons, so to speak. And so um, part of the work we're doing now, actually, with, with um, some of our customers is to understand the difference in lifetime value between those who first come via a coupon uh, or some sort of discount versus those who don't. And, you know, that's a real way of measuring how effective coupons actually are. Yeah, and no, what's, no. The, what's the that's a good point actually because I often um, look at some of the customers that I think we've had through a coupon and I'm not sure that they are repeat customers you know we're doing yeah. it for ranking purposes yeah. frequently um, so do you have any anecdotal information right now that would tell us what um, yeah sure um, I mean, I've actually have anecdotal evidence both ways <laughs> <laughs> um, and so we, we've certainly seen cases where uh, the majority of new to brand, uh, they you know, do a promotion and it was about 75% new to brand. Um, mm -hmm. And then in terms of lifetime value, you don't have to keep offering them a coupon to entice them to purchase again. So that's actually pretty good. Uh, yeah. But, in, in, you know, we've, we've certainly had a case which goes the other way, which is to say the majority were existing customers who probably would have bought anyway from you again, uh, but they just got it cheaper because it was a coupon. And so um, it's difficult. It's difficult to say. We're kind of figuring out: is it because, uh, you know, is it to do with seasonality and timing? Is it to do with the individual product? Uh, you know, those sorts of things. I mean, clearly the price points is is, is a big factor there. If you're selling quite a high priced item and you're offering a discount, obviously that's going to you know entice people a hell of a lot more versus something that's you know not a single digits or whatever it may be. So uh, the, the jury is uh, the jury is still out. Um, to do that, but it is. But the good news is, is is that it is actually possible to do that. You can separate out the lifetime value via uh, the initial acquisition method. Yeah, and you know, it, I think with everything like this, there's not one answer that fits every seller in every category with every product yeah. and every brand yeah. position. Mm -hmm. You need to analyze your own data, and you have to analyze what your actual customers are doing, because. We could tell you what works for us, or Shelley could say, or, or Rael could say what works for them, or Danny. But what matters is what works for you, and what, what does your customers, your your cohort, your the people you happen to be bringing in through your advertising campaigns or your coupons, what do they do? How do they perform? And what do yeah, they buy? yeah. And I, I mean, I guess it's also quite um, dependent on how much leverage you have. I mean, clearly supplements. If you if you're a strong brand, then then maybe you you, you don't ha you know need to give away so much on on sort of coupons etc. But if it's you know if you're not and it's super competitive, then that you might have to go down that that route in the beginning. Um, but it doesn't mean that they're ultimately profitable for uh, to you. So yeah, it's, uh, it's a little bit frustrating answer just because it does vary so much. But it just really drives home the point that. Um, you just need to do this for uh, for your own business. Um, it's really hard, um, you know, to, to give general advice on that basis. So we've I mean, had, I, yeah, I'd say I think it's clear that those who are doing supplements um, are in a almost like a supermarket category. So the supermarkets very frequently will say to a buyer, "Buy three and get one," or "Buy uh, two and you get so much off." And so the consumer. Consumer behavior, particularly in the UK and in America, I guess, would be very well trained to go and buy in multiples because of the price advantage, whether or not they're that much of a brand loyal fan, because a consumable is like yeah. buying food. And so those those same behaviors apply. But clearly, if you're talking about the dog bed scenario, or maybe more likely the poo bag scenario, you know, do I really want another 500? No, I'll probably just wait. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever it is, you know, yeah. a, a, the kind of consumable. So I think it if it's food related or health related, um, it's more likely in my case, um, my items are giftable. So when I do the four for threes, I find that there are some people out there who don't have a lot of imagination and rather than buy four gifts, they buy uh, they buy the same thing for four different people. Yeah. And so my four for three uh, works really well because it gives them convenience, speed, yeah. and um, and they get wonderful gifts. Obviously, yeah, yeah. We, we've um, seen it, we've seen it being used quite well in cosmetics as well. So that tends yeah. to be something where people have a brand um, loyalty, affinity, etc. And so you know, if you, and something that clearly needs to be replaced you know on, on a frequent or semi-frequent basis so um yeah that, that's that's one that's that's less com commoditized shall we say 
Right. Okay, moving on, because um, there are a couple of other questions here. Sorry. Um, um, there's one about reviews. I think that's more for the group. Yeah, I, I, I replied to say that. Um, so any question not on topic, uh, please ask it in our Facebook group, and one of us or somebody from the group will, will answer for sure. It's uh, facebook.com slash groups slash scale for retail. Um, uh, next question we have is... Yeah, do join the group if you're not already in it, because it's a lovely community. <laughs> and everybody chips in and answers questions and actually that's where we are 24 7 when we're not meeting by webinar or indeed maybe eventually face to face <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, okay Sulkan, if your new brand does it make sense to use to do ppc using using your brand name um danny's already mentioned this did danny want to just talk a bit about the answer you gave yeah so i think it always makes sense to be running branded campaigns. So that's just campaigns targeting all like keywords that are related to your brand that include the brand name in there. Um, and sure, when you're just starting, there's going to be very little, if any, traffic for those keywords. But you got to think about it like in, in the future, if competitors are, if you start doing well, competitors are going to start bidding on those keywords. So you're protecting your brand from that. Um, also, um, customers who found your item one day and decided not to purchase, but then they come back to find it the other day. That's a very common use case where someone's gonna be searching for your brand name. So even if you're brand new, you're just probably missing out on some of those customers who are coming back later to get your product. But let's extend that further. You should probably be trying to bid on some other brands as well, the ones that you think that you compete well against. So maybe they're more expensive or maybe um, they don't have such good reviews or maybe, uh, you know, they are doing extremely well, but don't, you know, maybe have got some uh, behavior in there that indicates that they've done a lot of campaigns, but they don't actually have uh, brand loyalty, true brand loyalty. So those are some of the brands that you may want to target the same strategy, not just your own brand. Yeah, and yeah and by the way, guys, for product targeting, that's a really powerful strategy too. just like get all of your ASINs and just put that into a product targeting campaign where your pro your own products are showing up on all your other products. It's um, like really, really good returns on those kind of campaigns. Yeah, it's great. And the benefit of that is you also start adding your, your own products to your own frequently bought togethers. Um, so yeah. it yeah. helps reinforce that. Um, just the thing to, I mean, the, the little nuance I'd add to the reply there is that if you're doing this, if you're creating an own, own brand campaign or a competitive brand campaign, then separate them out so you can analyze those things separately. Um, yeah. And yeah, I repeat this over and over again, but test and learn. You know, this Let us give you the idea. We could advertise on our brand. We could advertise on competitive brand. We could advertise on uh, brands that are something that could be bought with our product. And then just create some campaigns to try those out, test them, run them for a few weeks or months uh, or a month or so, and then look at the numbers. And if it makes sense for you, keep doing it. If it doesn't work, either try and improve it or drop it and know, well, at least I tried that. And, you know, I, I know it doesn't work for me for, for whatever reason. Okay, so there's, there's another very long question here that someone's answered um, about, from Tony about when launching a new product and using auto to generate new search terms with a view to turning them into exact later on, would you recommend starting this with modified broad match? So I think this is for Danny to answer. Uh, or would you yeah. run alongside an exact match campaign for the life of a product? Yeah, so I mean, there was a number of questions about um, whether or not broad match modified is a replacement for other match types. So I always, run every single match type when we're starting like new campaigns for a new product and then just pare down what isn't working and scale up what is working there there doesn't seem to be any rule like broad match modified always performs better than this or always better than this um it's all over the place with different products so um in my opinion it just deserves testing with everything um and if you do have a product that falls into that category of what we're talking about with your broad campaigns probably perform poorly because they're just picking up all these other related products that Amazon thinks is yours. Then maybe you're probably gonna wanna scale down that broad campaign really quickly and then just get more specific with the broad match modified. Yep. Yeah, or just scale down uh, the budget on those words that are working, but maybe you don't wanna spend quite as much on because the ACOS isn't, um, you know, percentage isn't as great. Uh, but you might find that you're still getting sales. And so you don't want to completely 
uh, remove them, but you just can't afford the amount of traffic that goes through broad. Um, okay, cool. Uh, uh, Roberto, I, I can cover that. Um, can we get the PDF of the slides as well as the video recordings? Uh, so long as Rael and Danny send me the slides, I will send you an email with a link to them both. So yes. Absolutely. Of course. Cool. Uh, and then Ian, it, this sounds like an algebra question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it kind of looks like it doesn't. <laughs> what happens if I don't want to plus before every word example plus X, Y, Z, A, B, C. So yeah, it's an interesting case right there where you do have a plus in front of the first word, but not in front of the second word. So the broad match modifier only works for the words that have the plus in front of them. So any words that don't have that plus in front of them are going to basically act just like a regular broad match campaign where it's going to maybe have that word in it. It's maybe going to have synonyms of that word and everything like that. But the other word that has that plus in front of that, it's going to show up like exactly that word. So um, yeah, that's basically how it works. And actually, I have a related question. So what if your brand name is two words, one of which is very common? Like, for example, um, <clears throat> I don't know. Um, black, more... black and Decker, you just put plus black plus Decker. Okay, and but wouldn't black deliver all sorts of other black? But because keywords? you put because you have put plus black and plus decker, you'd have to have both of those in a search term. If someone okay. searched for a black bottle, they wouldn't get black and decker. So. Okay, okay, cool. All right, so that's cleared that one up. Um, cool. So on to the next one. Would you stop using phrase and broad match if you start using modified? Clearly not, because you said you do everything, Danny, but just uh, explain that a little bit better and maybe what the differences are between what you do with broad match modified and phrase so that we do see what you're saying. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's <laughs> never it's never a case of like, okay, we're, we're gonna introduce broad match modified and now we gotta shut off phrase and broad. It's always, it's always something to test out. Uh, like I said, these different campaigns, oftentimes we'll be testing the exact same keywords across the different campaigns. Um, they're going to be coming up with all sorts of things, like the phrase match campaign is going to just hyper-optimize itself around like these five search terms. And then the broad match modified campaign is going to optimize itself around these other search terms. They kind of The algorithm just works very differently and it very quickly just optimizes itself around different things. So I'm always of the you know, of the um, mindset just to have them all running and then just scale them up or down whenever they need to. Okay. Okay. Um, question from Adam about how do you factor in customers recommending your products to your customer lifetime value calculation? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, the example that I gave there, I said I could, you know, write a formula that's a couple of pages long to take into account everything. So uh, the simplified version is clearly advertising uh, costs are, are related to customer acquisition. If somebody, for instance, is uh, paid to recommend your product, affiliate sort of situation, then sure, you'd need to subtract that commission uh, as part of your customer acquisition cost. Absolutely. Um, so mm -hmm. surely, uh, I mean, we would absolutely recommend doing that. Um, clearly, the best, clearly the best products in the world, those that have, I guess, very strong sort of network effects, uh, kind of you don't have to pay people to recommend because the product's just that good, right? <laughs> um, but um, but yeah, I mean that's uh, anything relate any cost you have to pay to acquire a customer, uh, and, and affiliate would certainly fall within that. Yeah, and, uh, I, I mean again to add to that, um, that, there are two different ways to look at customer lifetime value. You look, you can look at it, you can look at an individual customer and their journey through with your brand and, and try and work out for that one customer what was their CLV. The other way to look at it is in, is in bulk. And so if we if we look at our entire customer base and everything we sold in the past year, um, how much did we spend on you know, th those upfront costs and how much did we actually make from those people to work an actual estimate of average customer lifetime value across your entire audience? Um, and when you do that bulk one, that will then include within it some some concept of the network effect and everything else because you know, all, of, all of the sales you're making, some of those are coming from people recommending your products. Um, unless you have some way of tracking it, you can't you can't analyze it down to a single single person when you look at a single person. Um, but you know you can you can get a feel for it by looking at everything. Yeah, I, I think it's probably I haven't mentioned this uh, yet, but um, I get uh, the idea of cohort analysis. Um, if you want to sort of go a little bit deeper into all of that, so the idea is here: if you've been selling, let's say, for two years, 
um, you start tracking the lifetime value of, of, let's say, the people who signed up in Q1 uh, in, in, in the first year versus the people who signed up in Q1 in the second year. And, and you know, how does their behavior differ? Um, and so, for instance, you know, they might, let's say the first cohort, the, the Q1 last year, uh, they might have made, you know, two purchases in the first quarter. Uh, but actually now uh, for the new, new this year, uh, they're actually only making one purchase. So it might be that when you're comparing like for like, taking out seasonality, things like that, because it's Q1 versus Q1, uh, it might be that the actual purchase behavior is changing. And now there might be a very obvious reason for that. It might be that, you know, you're, you're now only offering your product in a bigger capacity. And so there's no need for them to buy twice in the first quarter. But but it's it's useful to start understanding um, cohort analysis and how the behavior changes because that's uh, a pretty good indicator of of you know what's what's to come obviously yeah and I guess, I guess um, that when you're just starting you don't have the data to analyze so you Absolutely. just need to think about some of these things and just kind of pay yourself to try and make the most of them but then once you've got data and you've you've been running for a while you can start to do the analysis and actually see how these different types of customer behavior are actually working for your product and your brand um so you know if you're at the beginning of the journey you know you can't analyze you can't you can't measure back but think about them think about how you can improve basket value number of number of items purchased how can you improve repeat purchase order how can you if, yeah. if there's any sense in your product being subscriber safe can you set it up to be subscriber safe etc yeah. um, and then later you can then come back and analyze and, and work out where to focus uh, in, your incremental effort yeah I interestingly um if you um, are using, I guess, a third-party software tool to do this, the APIs that you that 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 you know you, you grant that tool access to um, actually do go back two years. <laughs> so, assuming you've been selling for two years, and assuming your product portfolio is roughly the same, right? You haven't sort of discontinued three quarters of it and starting again and whatever. Um, you do typically actually have a pretty good data set to work from right off the bat. Um, so, so you can some pretty decent analysis simply by connecting to, to, to an API for a tool to, to go and do that. Um, and the ad side is very different. The ad side, you can actually only go back 60 days. And so those who are familiar with using third-party tools and giving them, granting them access, that's why they typically can only go back 60 days. But it's very different on the on the retail data side where you can actually go back two years and, and get some pretty useful insights straight, straight up, yeah, off the bat. And um, we have a question here from Sophia, which is in the chat, um, which... I think what she's asking um, is whether you can also integrate Shopify into Nozzle so that you can see the behavior of those customers. Yeah, I, lo I love this question. Um, currently not, but we're working on a project with a customer to join those data sets. And so um, there are a couple of things here. There's the there's a technical challenge and there's a legal issue, right? And so uh, actually the legal issue is 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 okay right and so we we've spoken to amazon and you're able so long as the shopify the dtc or dot com your shopify site uh you know you've acquired them in the normal way etc cetera, etc cetera, um they they amazon doesn't have an issue joining the data sets uh from amazon to 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 your shopify site so that's that's amazing because i just thought the answer would be no, frankly. <laughs> yeah. <that's true. laughs> uh, the second thing is the technical challenge, meaning what? How are you going to join these two things? Because uh, Amazon doesn't give you the email addresses, which would be the obvious candidate uh, to go and do that. And so we've worked on a way that we, we are actually able to do that. Um, it doesn't doesn't necessarily have to be perfect, but um, you know, for instance, you are given the shipping address, and you can use that as a unique identifier. Um, are there cases where the same person will order it to like a home address and a, and, and a work address? Sure, but it will still give you an accurate enough number to understand what's what's going on there. And of course, you know the the, the questions that we're answering with, with this customer are around, uh, you know, how often is it that uh, it's actually a, there are a bunch of them, but the classic one is: do they first start off on Amazon, then how do I get them onto my D to C? Um, or is it the other way around? They first buy on D to C, and then it's just more convenient on Amazon. So, you know, what does that look like? Uh, and there's a bigger question of cannibalization, obviously. And so, um, you know, to what if how additive is Amazon? Am I acquiring new customers on Amazon that I would never have actually been able to acquire on my D to C? Now, that is the the, the big question. Um, and we've seen some pretty good evidence to suggest that you know they would they would never have come come on the D to C uh, to begin with, and um, and therefore they're actually 
Amazon is actually additive. And what's amazing to me actually is, is this, if you Google this, you can find some research on that. But it's amazing to me that Amazon just don't make a bigger fuss about that because this is clearly on top of mind for certainly the the bigger uh, the bigger ones that that are uh, that are doing DTC and kind of considering Amazon. But um, yeah, I know that's kind of a long answer, but we are able to both satisfy the legal one and the the, the technical one. Um, but we're kind of you know it's not rolled out in the product so to speak. We're just working kind of doing it in a manual way first before we uh, put that into the nozzle product. Okay, cool. So something that if you wanted a beta tester, there's yeah. Sophia. Who wanted <laughs> Indeed, <to> <laughs> always happy. <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, Christian, do you want to run uh, through yeah, some? There are several fairly technical questions from Richard about how to enter uh, uh, BMM cat keywords and so on and how to use files. I mean, the short answer is, you know, file uploads. There's templates from Amazon. You can download the template, enter your data and we upload it. Um, and I think Dan's already answered this, but you don't, there's not a separate broad match modified uh, match type. You just choose broad match as the um, as the type of match, and then you use the pluses to signify the the difference. Is that that's correct, right, Danny? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one thing as well, if you're using the Amazon bulk files, so uh, Richard, you just find that on the bulk operations tab, and you just download the uh, bulk files. So all those columns will be set up for you already. Um, sometimes adding all the plus symbols in there will really make Excel think it's a formula and just really screw everything up. Um, so you're going to have to do a little bit of formatting to, to those ones there and uh, make sure that it is formatted as text and not as um, a number or a formula there. So, um, you know, a little bit, little bit tricky. Um, that formula there that uh, I had in my presentation, um, I'll make sure that you guys have the, the slides there. Um, that formula will, will handle that pretty easily. Okay, cool. Sure. Thank you. Um, let's look. Uh, Danny, another one for you. Um, Tony just asked a question that said you're typing an answer, but uh, so depending on the product, either you run broad match alongside exact or modified broad alongside exact. Is that your recommendation? Um, alongside exact. Um, all right, I didn't finish typing that one there. So yeah, we always run all match types uh, for all products. Um, so depending on the product, either on broad match alongside exact or modified alongside exact. I mean, we, we run everything alongside exact phrase, broad, broad match, modified, and exact. Um, and then just, just really optimize them where they need to be optimized. Um, yeah, as far as I've seen, there doesn't seem to be any rule of, um, you know, where, where that should go. Actually, a question from me, uh, back to Nozzle, actually. So... If we want to use that strategy that Danny's just described yeah. in in your tool, can you facilitate that? Uh, not, well? not if it's going via bulk upload. So anything. So okay. there the are three ways to get data into Amazon, right? One is via Seller Central via the Amazon's user interface, of course. Uh, one is via bulk upload where you upload your your spreadsheets, and the third one is via API. Right, and so the API is any third-party tool that kind of programmatically does these things, um, and so clearly that's that's what we use. And right now, the uh, the API doesn't support um, th this method, basically. Okay. Yeah, um, I mean, I would say that you can still use our tool and then separately, you know, go and do a bulk upload, but that's kind of not recommend. I mean, it's also you don't have to log back into <laughs> Seller Central, right? So. Yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. All right. From Richard, how do we you how do you do broad match modified for a term with a hyphen in the middle of it? And he gave an example. I, I mean, Danny, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's plus and then quotes and then the, the thing with a hyphen and then quotes again. Um, I'm not sure if you need the quotes, but I think that works. Well, his example is his brand, obviously. So it's Sunvit dash D3. Yeah. So I, I think it's plus quotes sunvit dash d3 quotes and that way you're telling it telling amazon sunvit dash three d dash d3 is a, is a thing and then the plus means um to force it is that right yeah and, and also like from from what i've seen uh you guys can correct me if you've seen differently but from what i've seen amazon just typically treats a hyphen as a space and it, it's basically interchangeable and like the same way an exact match you can have like an s on the end of your exact search term or not an S and it'll just switch that interchangeably seems to be the same thing with a hyphen and a space. So I wouldn't worry about that. 
Yeah, so if and if that's the case, then just put plus sundip and then space and plus D3, and then that way you're covering, if Amazon's splitting it and considering it to be spaces, then you're making sure it has both of those terms. Yeah, okay. Uh, Tony, we can't answer that kind of question. He's asking about, he's, Tony's giving some numbers um, about numbers of sales, but it doesn't matter how many sales there are. It matters what the margins are and profitability and what yeah, yeah. I mean, activity is it you can't just yeah exactly level sales. yeah my answer was just it's just very hard to tell of, of those sorts of numbers um yeah I'm, ha I'm happy to have a separate you know uh follow-up on this and we can go into more detail but um yeah it's, it's, it's just really hard to say off there um question from me and i guess it's similar to the one we just answered uh about quotes and that again danny Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think if you do quotes with a plus, it does force that to be in the broad match modified. Um, but I could be wrong. Um, I wonder if it forces phrase. phrase. I mean, does it force the phrase? That one. Yeah. Um, I haven't tried doing that, Black and Decker. Um, yeah, I mean, it would it would get a similar result theoretically as just doing uh, plus Black, plus Decker, plus Drill as well. But in theory, um, but in theory yeah. it would force the phrase, right? It would force it to be Black and Decker all together in that order. So you wouldn't get if if the search was Decker Black Drill, it shouldn't match that that style of phrase. And I, I know I've never tried to do this, but just my my limited understanding of how the Amazon syntax works for search terms suggests to me that it would be trying to force Black and Decker in quote as as a phrase. As well as first yeah. control. I mean, theoretically, it would work. Um, typically, what I found is broad match modified. When you're getting that granular, it almost never is as good as being like more broad. I think the power really of broad match modified is just like finding the the very the smallest amount of words that are like qualifying words. Like if they have these words in here, then it's going to be something relevant. And then just letting the algorithm fill in the blanks. Otherwise, you know, you can use exact match and stuff like that. Um, so like whatever the smallest amount of words you can get in there and let the algorithm fill in the blanks, like that's where the, the real benefit of using broad match modified comes from. Actually, it, it can also save you using like too many keywords and getting totally confused, which I frequently suffer from. I mean, I, I have a spreadsheet with about two and a half thousand different keyword, um, permutations. Let me put it that way. Yeah. And a lot of that has come from the fact that I don't rely on one keyword tool, one keyword database. So I go into Helium 10, I use Viral Launch, I use uh, maybe a couple of others as well. And in the end, we have like potentially massive keyword databases because we like to, we used to have to cover it all. These days, you don't need to. You probably only need top um, 150. That's all Amazon can really cope with. But you know, it, it would save you on having to do all of that work. You could just keep it to 50 and then the plus signs will do the rest for you. So that's why I like the sound of this. It sounds like we could do some real rationalization and actually it would really help us with our PPC too. Okay, um, cool. Are we coming to the end of the? Wow, so many questions. So many people still on the webinar, by the way. So that's really it's, awesome. It, I've, I've got a question, if you don't mind, for Danny. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just want to understand uh, the broad match modified. Are there any other operations that you can use other than plus sign? So you can use like as if you're, you know, you're doing your Google searches with negatives and phrases and uh, uh, sort of quotes and all that kind of stuff. So, what are the limits, I guess, of of BMM? <laughs> Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I personally haven't tried anything except the pluses, but I yeah. did actually learn this technique from, you know, one of these Google Ads guys who's been doing Google Ads for, you know, close to 20 years or whatever, whoever, how yeah. long Google Ads has been around. So I'll have, yeah. to, I'll have to ask him, like, what what all those Google Ads tricks that we can maybe try on the Amazon platform and see if they just yeah. work. Yeah, I mean, I, it's funny. I mean, I use the plus signs and all that. I mean, I'm just doing Google searches to just get more relevant searches. And it obviously makes sense that, Google's clearly incorporated into into you know AdWords and everything else, um, but it's good to know that I guess there's you know there's some way of doing it on Amazon. I just um, wish they would support the API for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's a hack uh, as opposed yeah. to something that Amazon have designed. Yeah, fair enough. So that that's. 
that's where the problem Amazon's got a lot of catching up to do on Google, right? On all the yeah, functionalities. So much. I mean, but... you'd think they were a small business, right? But then you have Amazon. Yeah, so I keep saying that. It's incredible that it's incredible they've built a what thirteen, fourteen billion dollar ad business with, you know, no geo targeting, no differentiation between mobile and desktop, you know, none of this sort of plus stuff, uh, modifiers, etc. It's remarkable. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think I think if you ever speak to their teams, the ones that work on the PPC side of the business, not that you would ever get to anyone close to the algorithm, but <laughs> if you did, you, you'd probably be amazed by how um, uneducated they are themselves about uh, what what they themselves have to offer. So I, I just yeah, yeah. think that Amazon is still seeing it as very early days, hasn't invested in it fully. Yeah, I totally I totally agree with that. I mean, um, you know, at the end of the day, Google was always an ads first business. Literally, that is how they make their money from day one. Whereas Amazon yeah. is just not the case. It's not kind of in their DNA in the same way that it is for Google. And they're not that reliant on it, obviously, in the same way as Google. Having said that, we actually are pretty close to the API teams. Uh, for search and display and all that. Um, I mean, they are investing a hell of a lot into um, into the ad product, uh, both in sort of the, a, you know, the API sense and, and the user interface. So they're going to be some big changes, um, but obviously, you know, they're years away from catching up to Google in terms of functionality. It's not getting away from that. Yeah. Yeah. I did um, a quick search just then, um, and it looks like only the plus works as a modifier. There's no uh, right. minus nor tilde, um, so yeah. it's just plus. Um, okay. I mean, they have this separate negative kind of to withdraw, to, you know, to remove phrases from the general campaign. But yes. you know, the only way to use those uh, sanely is to have a very small campaign with with one match and then the negatives in against that one match. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, okay. Cool. Thanks for that. Cool, good. Um, so I think we are uh, probably definitely out of time. We might be out of patience, uh, but uh, so we're gonna call it to a close here. I have to say it was a fascinating session and I know that because everybody else thought so too. And we got tons of questions and sometimes these kind of areas around PPC and also customer lifetime value could, could um, have turned into a bit of a dry topic. So I have to thank all of our speakers for making it um, fascinating and <laughs> all engaged, which you did really, really well. Um, and uh, yeah, we're really looking forward to more. Uh, in particular, Danny, uh, th I think he thinks he signed up. I'm, I'm joking. Um, he's committed to come back and talk to us about uh, A plus content uh, in in a few weeks. So we'll be welcoming him back, and uh, I'm sure he'll do an awesome session. And uh, and Rael, yeah, we'll catch up. There's still the offer sure. to the community, right, from Nozzle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Um, so if they sign up, they get a free audit. Anything else? Was yeah, there? you can get the, the free audit. Um, clearly on the on the lifetime value stuff, um, you know, we're, we're happy to have an initial engagement there as well. As I said, there's a slightly more questions need to be asked up front just to understand whether it's a good place and where you're at, et cetera. But happy to have all those conversations uh, via the website. There's a chat function on intercom, so we can do that. All schedule calls, very happy to um, to help, help out on that. Awesome. Great stuff. Well, Thank you to everyone. And One thank thing, Shelley, for... before we close. Yeah. Uh, next week, we've got Ryan Rigney coming in. Uh, so True. quick shout out about that. I put a link just in the chat. Um, we'll, we'll advertise it on it. We'll, we'll let people know about it on our Facebook group and through email as well. Uh, but Ryan's coming in. Uh, I just put the details up uh, about 20 minutes before we went live. So have a look at the page. Uh, have a quick look. And hopefully, we'll see you all next week. Actually, let's just say who had a rooster it. costume. He told me he like purchased a rooster costume for his new Boost Rooster software there. So you're going to have to ask him to show up. <laughs> <laughs> so just to explain to those who don't know Ryan, he is someone that I've been talking to for a few months. And we actually wanted to get him to come over to the UK. But obviously, COVID-19 got in the way and actually the fact that he's about to become a father. Um, and, um, but he is uh, an, an amazing seller. He does supplements. So for all you supplement people out there, you really must come along and listen to his session. And he has absolutely perfected two arts, but he's gonna talk about one of them. 
so one art is the whole chatbot sequencing and how to really drive ranking uh, to, to uh, and actually get a control over that customer base coming from Amazon. He's an absolute ace at this. Uh, and he also has a tool that he's built in order to help those of us that aren't as technically guru-like as he is. Uh, but the other thing that he isn't going to talk about, but he does, is he also has uh, an amazing skill at getting people's emails, even though Amazon is obviously the key platform from which he sells. Uh, and so he's built his list. He has an extremely good, uh, healthy business. Uh, and he's going to come and enlighten us next week. So I'm really looking forward to that as well. Yeah, and I think one of the things he's going to talk about is something we mentioned today, which is um, if you're running a, a promotion or campaign, how do you make sure you have high quality buyers coming in through that campaign right. to make sure you're not just throwing money away on a one-off discount yeah. purchase and trying to actually acquire customers that are going to serve you? So I'm yeah, and cool that's that well. repeats, so to increase your customer lifetime value. <laughs> there you go. Cool. Thank right. you, everybody. Well, thank you, everyone, and goodbye. And we'll see you all next week, hopefully. Take Brilliant. Care. Thank you very much for having yeah. me. It's been great. Good morning, everybody. See you all soon. Bye.